Right, OK, we welcome into the, st- into the studio now uh, Tonosta and leader of the Fine Gael party, Leo Varadkar. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to have you here. Good morning, David. Great to, great to be here. Uh, right, of course, uh, you know, there was big news uh, for Fine Gael locally. Mm-hmm. Um, we had uh, Joe McHugh saying that he's not going to seek uh, election at the next election. And of course, you're up here uh, Friday. Happy coincidence of timing or, or uh, did you just move things around so that, you know, the announcement came in the same week that you're going to be up speaking to party members? Um, no, no, it, it was there. There was some coordination around it. So Joe called me a few weeks ago to let me know of his plans, and we had a discussion involving me and um, our party general secretary as to what the best way to, to handle it was. And uh, uh, kind of felt to be strange if I came here, spent the day in Donegal, which I was going to do anyway, and then suddenly announced it a week or two after. So we thought it'd be a good opportunity to um, make the announcement and then and then talk to the members tonight a, a about plans for the future. But the most important thing I suppose I'd like to get across today really is, is just to pay tribute to Joe. Um, Joe and I were elected to the Dáil uh, in the same election back in 2007, both regained seats for the party in areas where we didn't have a seat at the time, um, served on the front bench together. Uh, I had the honour of appointing him as Chief Whip and Minister for Education. Um, and now the highlight of his political career, he said, getting that call from you on a Friday night. Yeah, well, I remember too. Like he remembers it obviously from from his side. I, I remember I was sitting outside an apartment building in Ranelagh trying to get him from the car, and uh, I think he was watching um, the late late or something. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, we we, we we had three years in government together around that cabinet table, dealing with really big issues, Brexit, which is such such an important issue here in Donegal. Um, very much the mic issues kicked off during that period as well, um, which Joe's been a very strong advocate for. Uh, and then also, you know, issues around uh, growing the economy and reforming education. And uh, Joe's given Donegal enormous service, given Fine Gael enormous service. Um, and uh, really sorry to see him go. Um, we do have a change of mind form available. Uh, people do sometimes <laughs> change their mind. But um, I, I think what he's done uh, I- in many ways is helpful to the party because in run, run up to the last election, we had a number of TDs who decided they were retiring, didn't give us much notice. Uh, and uh, we had to scramble to find a candidate mm. at the last moment. Um, now we've two years, you know, two years to do succession planning, and uh, and uh, you know we've um, a number of very strong councillors, and then perhaps uh, people, you know, maybe from outside the traditional um, uh, family who, who may be interested in running. And yeah, and, and with no disrespect to, to the councillors you mentioned, um, loyal servants, of course, and, and I've uh, uh, in, in 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 terms of Councillor Martin Harley, they've been there for you in the past to, to run alongside Joe, uh, but you would know we've got a, a very low female representation on Donegal County Council. Uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, no female uh, TD for quite some time in Donegal. Um, would it be your preference that um, the party would look at that in Donegal to try and um, uh, perhaps look towards a, a female candidate, for example? Um, well, you know, ultimately, it's the members here in Donegal who'll decide. Who but the you're the leader. Is. Um, and I should just, uh, you mentioned Martin Hardy there. Martin added quite late to the ticket last time, did very well, actually, um, g- g- given given the limited amount of time that he had uh, to, to run that campaign. Um, the party is going to run uh, 40% of our candidates mm. in the next election, at least, will be women. Um, so, you know, the the logical thing we will try to do in, in each constituency is to run one man and one woman. That won't always be the case, but that's what we'll try to do mm-hmm. uh, in most constituencies, and that's the objective we'll be working towards. And, you know, Fine as a party, uh, that... that has a good record um, on female participa- participation in politics. I'm, I'm, I'm one, you know, of the Finnegan ministers around the table, excluding me. It's, it's three men and three women. Uh, we have 65 female councillors, more than any any other party. Three out yeah, of but that's why I'm highlighting Donegal because there's, there's, there's yeah, arguably yeah, a particular is. issue yeah. here, not just actually with Fine Gael, of course. Other parties had opportunities, perhaps with co-option, where they could have looked at, uh, you know, uh, uh, diversifying the council. Somewhat they didn't. So I'm not, I'm not hanging this all on Fine Gael, but I'm just saying there does seem to be a particular. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, to the electorate ultimately decide, but it's about giving them choice. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and and the electorate can't vote for female candidates unless they have mm. female candidates. And you know, w- one thing that's going to be an issue, of course, in Donegal is where the boundaries lie. You know, that's is, it, is yeah. it going to be a five seater again? Could it be two, three seaters? Who knows? Um, and we won't know that really until Christmas or, or early in, early in the new year. So we can't really make firm decisions mm-hmm. until then. But certainly, the intention in pretty much every constituency uh, would be to have uh, a gender balance ticket, and that would be a man and a woman. Um, it is it is it is harder in in um, more rural constituencies and constituencies that are further away from Dublin, and that is the nature of politics. You know, it is a twenty four seven business that isn't going to change. Residents are still going to have meetings at night. You know what I mean? Yeah, but that's the same at council level. I mean, yeah, you know, I'm not broadening out the, problem, the conversation, yeah. but I mean, if we are hoping to encourage uh, people. 
uh, to come into politics from from different backgrounds with different responsibilities, uh, we have to change the system, don't we? I mean, the way the councils run at the moment, you know, meetings that run for 10 hours, you know, then people yeah. have uh, to fulfil obligations in the evening and then clinics and, and, and the same as you said, particularly, I suppose, for rural TDs, as you've outlined. Uh, I mean, are we going to make any inroads into looking at that to make it a, a more realistic proposition for a, a, a broader section of society, do you think? Well, yes, and I think um, I think being family friendly isn't just important for women; it's important for for, for men as well. Um, and the kind of things we have changed, for example, is uh, you know the dolls' hours now are much more family friendly in terms of when votes happen. Councils can do that too, and they should. Um, mm. And uh, and for example. Um, you know, for example, a lot more things can be done remotely so people can do things from home that they couldn't do before. But you can't entirely change the world. You know, I still think residents associations are going to have their meetings at night. I still think public meetings are going to happen at weekends. You know, I still think the media is going to have shows in the evening, for example. You know, I don't see the media cancelling uh, prime time or the late debate or any of those things. So uh, there are changes that we can make, but there are also, you know, bigger societal mm. things that, that are harder to change. And actually, things like the media, for example, and, and politicians have to do a lot of media. That's that's more twenty four seven than it ever was, and mm. I don't see I don't see the media changing that in the interest of the quality. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, obviously, you, you're here uh, to uh, address or attend the Fine Gael AGM, um, that, and also you're going to visit the Canton Museum, uh, and you've got other um, other uh, things to do. Uh, you mentioned the biggest issue here at the moment is uh, Micah. Uh, are you going to use this opportunity to meet? with any of those uh, directly affected by this uh, crisis during your visit, considering it is, uh, without argument, I don't think, the biggest uh, single mm. issue facing the people of Donegal and, as we know now, beyond. Well, well, I should say that the first thing I did this morning was to visit uh, TCS, Tata Consultancy mm. Services, here in Letter Kenny. I'm the Minister for Enterprise Trade of course, and Employment. Yeah. It's, it's my job to um, uh, increase the number of job opportunities in all parts of the country. Uh, things are going really well there. Um, they have 170 jobs mm -hmm. open for people who may wish to apply for them. We've had two uh, IDA investment announcements in the last couple of months. We're working on another one uh, in the next couple of months. Um, and it's good to see so Is that letter can you based again? Um, co commercially confidential, so mm -hmm. I can't say. But as you know, we've we've three IDA sites in uh, Letterkenny. We've one in Donegal and one in Ballyshannon mm -hmm. as well. So um, we're interested in getting investment into all of them. But, uh, you know, it, it is great to see so many more job opportunities available in Donegal than was the case in the past. Um, and I'm working on that to make that better. And also remote working is really helping as well in terms of people's uh, choices. And one thing I'm anxiously waiting to see is, is the census results, because uh, as you know, in 2016, Donegal was one of only two counties where the population actually went down. Uh, I think we're going to see a big turnaround yeah. in that. Uh, and, you know, we have seen a lot of economic progress in, in, in the county and that didn't happen by accident. You know, it happened because of the hard work of people here on the ground, the business community, but also the government making yeah. some of the right decisions in the last couple of years as well. Are you going to be meeting with any of those directly affected by the MICA crisis? I am, yes. So I'm, I'm meeting the Action Group at, um, at half eleven today. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember many years ago, uh, Joe McHugh bringing me to uh, a house in, in Bundor and it was Anya Daly's house. And I, I think I was the first Was it Boncrana, sorry? It was Trillick, is that right? Okay, I think, yeah. yeah right. In, near Boncrana. Um, I think it was Trillick. Yeah. Um, but I... I I don't no, that's fine. You said uh, yeah. I just, uh, but, but yeah, that's fine. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah. Trillick near Bunkrana. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, um, I, I don't don't remember exactly where it was. No, I'll that's, never, that's I'll never fine. Remember, I'll never yeah. forget the visit <laughs> because, yeah. you know, really seeing a house crumbling is quite an experience. Mm. Uh, and um, I, I'd seen, seen seen the problems with pyrite in my own constituency, but hadn't seen the scale or devastation of my until then. Um, and you know, it, the scheme is too long coming. I acknowledge that entirely. Um, lots of reasons for that. Uh, but was speaking to the minister there only, only the other day. Um, you, you know, it's still his intention, and I think this will be delivered. Uh, is that we'll have the legislation? Is ISS um, IS four six five going to be before, before the summer? Oh, do you, you're confident it'll be passed before the summer? Before the summer, summer recess, yeah. Okay, and um, do you think uh, the IS uh, four six five will be uh, looked at to include? Uh, pyrotite materials as well. Obviously, mm. you know, people are seeing that really as the problem that Mike is one of the problems. The, the true problem is this uh, this mineral that is mm. having, you know, a, a, a broader impact and not just in Donegal now, as you'd be more than yeah. aware, it's spreading right across the country, the uh, West Coast anyway. That's the, the pyrotite, yeah. Yeah, pyrotite. So, yeah, so that, 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 that is currently under examination at the moment. But, you know, the fundamental principle is um, defective uh, building mm -hmm. and defective blocks. And, um, while it is going to cost a lot of money, it's going to cost billions of euros and it's going to affect many more parts of the country than Donegal. You know, the fundamental principle here is that the government society 
you know, can't allow people's homes to crumble around them, uh, can't, have, can't allow people to become homeless as a result. Uh, and that's why we're going to intervene. And it shouldn't be about which county you're in or which mineral is the cause of the defect. Mm-hmm. The fundamental principle is that, um, you know, where insurance companies won't, uh, the government will intervene. Uh, to ensure that people's homes can be repaired or rebuilt. Uh, so when when do you think that might homeless. start ha- start happening in a meaningful way? Obviously, there's you know four or four or five or six hundred four four or five hundred applications at the moment stalled as uh, as as the scheme is being reviewed. Five or six houses have been completed, uh, I mm. think, since uh, the the ninety ten scheme. Um, when when do you think we'll start seeing houses being repaired in large numbers where we have can have workers and, and materials to actually yeah. do that of course uh, but when when would you hope to see that happening so the, the, the timeline that we're working on is to have the legislation enacted uh, before the summer, summer recess so you're talking there Ju- June July uh, to have the scheme up and running uh, later this year and then you'd expect I suppose next year to see a significant building works um, underway notwithstanding all the problems that arise around labour and mm. materials and all the rest of it. Um, but, you know, I do think this will be going on for a long time. Uh, you, you know, this this will be going on for many, many years. Um, and it is important, I suppose, that we start with those homes most in need and those that are dangerous, quite frankly, at the moment, yeah. and that they're the ones that get done first. And you'd be confident that this will be 100% uh, redress, that those uh, who have their houses uh, restored uh, w- won't be out of pocket? Um, 100% or something very close to it, certainly. Mm. Okay. How, how close, though? I, I'm not going to put a figure on it, but... but well, I, we did you before. Know, we had 90-10 yeah, before, yeah. so... Well, it's not 90-10. Like, it's not 100 it's, either, it's, then. Like, you know, I, 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 what I don't want to say is that nobody will ever have to contribute uh, a euro at all to anything mm-hmm. like that, you know, because that, 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 that may not be the case. But certainly, certainly 100% is what the government has committed to. But, you know, I don't want to say 100% and then suddenly mm-hmm. turn around and say they have to, you know pay a certain amount of money out of their pocket for one reason or another, particularly if it involves um, something outside the scheme. Yeah, understood. Um, just br- br- broadly speaking, nationally, I suppose, it's international. Do, do you get a sense, though, or, or, or do you have any in- indication? Are we heading towards a recession? Speaking to a lot of people, there is that sense. The mm. only thing, a lot of stuff feels the same, except maybe not the large amount of personal borrowing, but an awful lot feels the same as 2006, 2007, 2008, is that the direction of traffic? Is that where we're heading? Do you think in the next year or two? Well, I, I, I think what happened in in, in that period, um, the Great Recession back in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, was one of t- was two things. There was the the global financial uh, crisis, which obviously affected Ireland, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, and all of that. Um, and there was also then this this housing credit bubble, um, a huge amount of reckless lending, reckless borrowing. Um, uh, which was very much uh, an Irish problem. It wasn't as acute in other countries. Um, so we don't have that this time. Uh, you know, we have an economy that is growing. Um, that has been created every day. Uh, I think we're going to reach record levels of employment, mm. 2.5 billion people at work by the end of the year. Um, that's kind of my number one target to achieve, if you like, full employment and jobs for everyone in all parts of the country. Uh, the public finances are in a very good state, actually. Um so the domestic picture, I think, is actually strong and, and reassuring, and everyone was predicting uh, ongoing economic growth this year. Um, the big concern is those international factors, and you know we are only a small country, and we're only five million people in a world of eight thousand million people, and that would be the worry. You know, if if Britain went into recession, if the U.S. went into recession, um, or if Europe did, those things could, could impact us. I I think we will avoid it, um, but um, but. You can't be complacent about these things mm. either. You know, I, I remember, I have, haven't always been in government. When I was in opposition, I remember hearing politicians trotting out that line, the fundamentals of our economy are sound. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, any, any time I hear someone say that, I get worried. So, you know, we're monitoring the situation very closely as to what's happening in, in the rest of the world. Mm. Obviously, the big fear uh, is around uh, rising costs and energy prices something larger beyond our control. Just in relation to that, I mean, people struggle, I struggle uh, to uh, square the circle of uh, oil companies reporting record Mm. profits um, and yet we're supposed to be in a a fuel crisis and uh, we are, you know, 1,200 euro for a thousand litres of oil. A lot of houses might burn that in three months. You know, maybe we could look to diverse away from that, but putting putting that to one side for a moment. Is there anything as a government we can be doing, a windfall tax or whatever it might be, uh, so that the, those ridiculous profits, their obscene profits that these oil companies are making in this crisis can lighten the load 
on our population mm. in terms of, of, of the cost of energy. Yeah, well, you know, companies operate off margins. So, you know, if prices double and their margin is 3%, that their their profit and cash terms increases. Um, I think we can do windfall taxes on uh, companies that have uh, disproportionately benefited from... Um, uh, Are we actively looking at that? The, well, the difficulty is they're, they're, they're generally not Irish companies, like yeah. British BP, Shell, you know, course, whatever. Yeah. These are not, you know, these oil and gas companies are not, not Irish companies and they're, and they're, they're not taxed here. Um, the only place where that might arise is around some of the energy companies, you know. So say, for example, if ESB made a... Um, a mega profit. Mm. Uh, so we have to, no internally. We have no mechanism uh, to to leverage in in, in, um, in the, oh, in the oh, way. Oh, we do. Um, like for example, from state companies like ESB and Borgash, mm. we can take a bigger dividend. Um, we already take a, a big dividend off them, and that goes into into the pot to pay for health and education and everything else. Um, uh, and then you know, with some of the other energy companies that are privately owned, we could uh, do windfall tax if they report windfall profits, which they haven't yet. Mm. Um, but it's 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 on a relatively small scale. Yeah, it's not like BP or no. We're not going to have BP over an oil barrel, or, uh, yeah, so to speak. We don't, we don't yeah, no, them. I understand that. We don't tax them. Uh, I just wanted to put that out there because we, the tax come in all the time, yeah. and I just wanted to make it clear what what influence we yeah. could have as a country in, in that regard. So, so I appreciate so, you, know, you addressing like, that. Like, like, certainly not ruling out a windfall tax, mm. and we could use some of that money to help people with fuel poverty, for example. But it's you know it's it's, it's not that those oil and gas companies are headquartered in tax mm. in Ireland. They're not. You know we don't. We don't have any oil and we don't have much gas, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, obviously, one of the big stories at the moment is, is the, the, the turf and the banning of turf. Mm. And it's how we're treated as the public in terms of how these conversations happen. Eamon Ryan says something, then you say something else. Uh, I'm not sure uh, at that time if it had even been discussed amongst government partners. We got the leaks out of, you know, cabinet meetings. We got the leaks out of uh, parliamentary party meetings. You know, we're reading and learning stuff out of the newspapers. Uh, can you not do anything about that whereby the public are treated with some respect and maybe were the first to hear about uh, some policies or were the first to hear about major changes to our lives? I mean, we're not talking about thousands of people here, but it feels people feel very disrespected uh, and, and you know, uh, behind newspapers in terms of, of importance. Yeah, look, at this this whole thing could have been handled a lot better. And I think um, I certainly acknowledge that. I think Mr. Ryan would as well. Do you um, agree now, by the way? Sorry, you and Eamon Ryan. We, we, we both agree that nothing's decided <laughs> and uh, it hasn't been, uh, by, by the way. Um, and it certainly wouldn't have been the intention of anyone in government to uh, show disrespect to our citizens and to our voters. That's not, not the way we operate. Um, you know, ultimately, we rely on the support of citizens and voters to continue mm. in our jobs. And we would never deliberately... Uh, disrespect people, but I can understand why people may feel that way, um, because uh, you know, particularly for people who heat their homes with turf, you, you know, just to kind of hear that something was happening and then it wasn't happening, you, you know, it's it's not very fresh on our part, uh, and I, I know can cause anxiety for people, and that definitely was never uh, mm. was never our intention. Um, what this is about is it's about air quality, um, and um, you know, the truth is burning. Uh, sod turf burning smoky coal um, you know burning wet wood puts particles into the air and those particles get into your lung can cause lung cancer they get into your blood can cause strokes and heart attacks and whether you live in rural Ireland or urban Ireland people Mm -hmm. are entitled to um, better air quality and that's our objective you know 1300 people die 10 years earlier than they should every year um, because of our poor air quality so we need to do something about it Mm. Um, the biggest culprit is actually uh, smoky coal, um, a lot of it being imported from Northern Ireland, where their environmental laws are weaker than ours. Hopefully, the new executive might change that. Um, so we need to do something to improve our air quality, but it needs to be done in the right way. And you know, I'm very much of the view that people who um, save turf, who have their own turf, should be continued continued to mm. be able to do that. No but Eamon Ryan says that's for 2022. But when these new rules come into uh, effect in September, if they're mm. agreed, as he wants them, things could be very different for 2023. So he's giving assurances yeah. effectively. He believes all the turf will be saved and uh, it will be start being burnt before September. 2023 is only next year, obviously. What will, the, what will be uh, mm. life for, for people who cut their own turf? maybe give it to their elderly neighbours, mm. maybe sell a few bags. Will they be able to do that in 2023? Well, you, you know, first of all, no regulations are agreed yet. Uh, and But he keeps um, suggesting that this is going to be uh, the law in September. I, well, I think, think he's expressing his intention there. But just to be clear, no regulations have mm. been signed off by government yet. They haven't. Um, and uh, all three parties will have to sign off on them. Um, what I can say to people who, you know, save and burn their own turf, that's their own business. Um, government's not going to intervene in that at all. 
the question really is around distribution um you know gifting turf to other people or or, or the sale of it um and that's where we need to uh, work something out um and you know i think where people have traditionally uh, given turf as a gift to somebody maybe a relative a friend an elderly neighbor that that should be allowed to continue mm. um and i think selling on a small scale should be allowed to continue as well but what's happening too much particularly in the midlands uh, you know, it's odd turf and wet wood being sold in petrol stations, being sold in retail outlets, um, being burnt in housing estates. Um, uh, and that, that's not good because that is damaging the air mm-hmm. quality uh, in rural towns in particular. And that has health impacts on everyone. OK, I know we've only got a couple of minutes. You've a busy agenda. Uh, just to Northern Ireland, uh, counting of votes is, is, is a beginning now. Things play out uh, as uh, are being predicted. And listen, we're not going to hold you to this because we simply don't know, but we're getting indications, of course, we have for some time that uh, Sinn Féin could be the biggest mm-hmm. party in Northern Ireland. Um, the Middle Ground Alliance doing very well, of course, as well. Uh, have you any confidence that a, a government and executive can be formed in Northern Ireland uh, post um, post this election? Uh, oh, oh, I think it will be. Um, I just Soon, hope, sorry, I should say. Yeah, well, I just, I just hope, I hope it'll take weeks or months and not years and... Uh, we've had seen we've seen too many breaches and breaks in in the in the continuity of the executive in the past. Uh, you know the votes are only being counted, uh, so we're going to need to see what happens. Um, I think Sinn Fein will emerge as the largest party, but not because their vote will be up and might actually be down. Um, the reason why they'll emerge as the largest party is the unionist vote is fractured among three parties, um, and what we may see um, actually is is the combined nationalist vote going down. Uh, the combined unionist vote going down and the middle ground you know, mm-hmm. made up of Alliance and the Greens actually being the ones that are growing. And that is interesting, you, you know, because that that is a change in the politics of Northern Ireland that uh, many of us, including me, have hoped to mm-hmm. see for a very long time. You know, people actually going away from the sectarian parties um, and supporting parties that are cross community. Um, and that, I think, raises an opportunity because if you go back to the original Good Friday Agreement, it wasn't the case that the biggest party uh, got the um, got the first minister's job. When you go back to the original Good Friday Agreement, it was to be a cross community vote, um, and I think that's you know the space that we may need to explore after this. Um, you know, the first minister and the joint and the deputy first minister they're just titles; mm-hmm. they're actually co equal. Um, you, you know, and yeah. it's bragging rights in many ways. And you know, are we, re- are we really going to not have an executive for two years or three years because of bragging rights? You know why not have a joint first minister? Yep. You know, so these are the kind of things I think we'll need to discuss. La- the, last the two que- last two questions. Do you think your government will be your party will be in government after the next election? Do you think it might suit your party maybe for a period of opposition? I know you're prepared to take your party into opposition, mm. uh, but obviously you felt that you had to uh, work with Fianna Fáil to to put a, a functioning government into place. Uh, it's a long way away, of course, uh, and you might uh, may do very very well. But do you think maybe Irish politics in the Republic needs? A, a break from Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael working together, maybe for both the parties to to establish their their single identities again. Well, you know, I I think the problem is that it, of that is is there would be very negative consequences. Mm. Um, you know, almost certainly, the alternative to the current government would be a Sinn Féin led government, um, uh, and um, the effects of that, I think, not not in, immediately, but within a year or two, would be a decline in our economy. Um, a loss of jobs and investment, um, people's standard of living and incomes falling. Um, they have a very different view of the European Union than us. They are a Euro critical party. Um, uh, we're soft on, on Russia until very recently. I wouldn't like to see that being our position uh, in Brussels or, or in Europe. Um, we see on issues like climate, for example, where they're against any climate action um, that is anyway unpopular, and that's the biggest crisis of our time. Uh, and while they talk a lot about housing, they're not particularly in favour of home ownership. Um, and we see them opposing uh, private housing developments all over the show. Well, I think that was fact um, checked by the journal, in fairness, but I, I take your point. The government gets an awful lot of criticism on programmes like these, so mm. that's why I'm letting you. <laughs> no, it's fair enough. Fair but, enough. But, so, yeah. so, you know, I, I can hear what you're saying. That, like, we're, we're in our third term in government. Um, and um, I'm sure there are loads of people in my party who, who would, or there are a number of people in my party, not the majority, um, who might take the view, you know, it's time for a break, time to rebuild. Um, and, but you're and, not and of that view. No, no, I'm not, because the reason why I'm in politics isn't, isn't just to advance Fine Gael. The reason why I'm, I'm in politics is to build a better country and a better community. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the government that we have, while it's imperfect, is doing well. Now we're making progress as a country. 
um, outperformed lots of other countries, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's mm. the economy, whether it's living standards. Um, and I don't want to see Ireland go backwards. Okay. Um, you know, I hate this idea that, you know, let's give people a taste of Sinn Féin and then they might appreciate us more. Like, I hate that attitude um, because that means people having to suffer and I don't want to see that. OK, very finally, wh when do you hope to hear from the DPP as it relates to um, their invest or the Garda investigation, their consideration of it? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, I've no indication. Um, uh, you'll understand for very good reasons. I, of course. I don't want to speculate about timelines or hypotheticals because I don't want to say anything that might be perceived as me putting pressure on an independent office. I'm not going to do that. Um, but what I can say is that the allegations uh, that were made against me are false. Mm. Um, they're politically motivated. Um, but you didn't do the right thing in, 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 in um, making that document available, did you? Well, the allegation is that I committed some sort of crime. Or oh, but I didn't ask that didn't question. That. But did you think, do you think it, it was befitting of, of uh, your position to do what you did? Um, I, I acknowledge that uh, I, I didn't do the right thing in that mm. regard. Um, you know, I, I did it for a good reason. Um, the government had made a commitment that we would uh, consult uh, both of the GP, body, GP bodies. That commitment hadn't been honoured. Mm. I took it into my own hands to honour that commitment. Um, you're often told in politics, intervene personally, pick up the mm -hmm. phone, sort this out, Minister. Um, mm -hmm. th that's what I did. Um, but in doing so, I, I left myself to ex exposed. But you say that the allegations are... So I, so I, I, I wouldn't do it again. Yeah, you I, said the allegations are politically... I, I did it for good reasons. I did it in the public interest. Yeah, but you're saying the allegations are politically motivated, are presumably not suggesting that the Guardi or interview uh, uh, were, were influenced politically to, to carry out their conduct their investigation. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, also an important meeting in Milford. You meet with Declan Meehan as well to, to meet yeah. you, the Ukrainian community there, just very finally. Sorry, yeah, I meant to yeah, mention look, that earlier. I'm looking forward to that and just, just really want to express my appreciation and recognition of communities across Donegal who have um, welcomed Ukrainians uh, into, into their communities. And, you know, we're all watching on television the horrors that people mm. are experiencing in, in that country. And, um, you know, I just really want to just to express my thanks to, to anyone who's been involved in the efforts, not just in Milford, anywhere, anywhere in Donegal or yeah. the country where uh, where people have been welcomed in, into into communities because, you know, they, they really need it. Yeah, I might ask Declan Mahin to join your party, maybe. Um, He's got political aspirations. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't know Declan, Declan but I hope, <laughs> hope they will after we'll today. See, so. We'll see after your conversation. <laughs> uh, I asked him this last Friday. He says, no, he's not interested. He's uh, But anyway, listen, thanks very much for your time this morning. I appreciate it greatly. I appreciate it.